confession and repentance as well. Because the Bible says confession is good for the soul. All right, we've been working through Romans chapter 10. And I entitled this, Israel's Rejection of God. I'm going to preface this message by saying a few things real quickly. It's only six verses. So how long can that possibly take me to preach? It's a fair question. It could take a while, but it's only six verses. Now, I kept hearing that last week's sermon was pretty good. In fact, I got more compliments on last week's sermon than I had in a long time. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just preach that again for about three more weeks because it really does help my self-esteem. Then I talked to my wife about it, and she said, that's probably not a good idea. Um, why don't you preach something new? I'm looking at Romans 10, verses 15 through 21. Okay, we're going to close Romans 10 today. We're going to get into Romans 11 next week. Before I get into this, I want to talk about a couple things. Um, <clears throat> we call it the freedom of bondage because it's the book of Romans. Paul is the writer to the church of Rome. Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. His life was forever changed. He was knocked down. He saw a beautiful light, and the Lord stood before him, and he said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He said, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. And he was blinded, and he had to be led away, my friends. Now, this is much later, but Paul is a Roman citizen. He had dual citizenship. He's a Roman citizen. He is a Pharisee from the tribe of Benjamin. He is, was probably fairly wealthy, definitely educated. When the Lord came into his life, it wasn't about what he had or what he had accomplished. It was about the mission that God had for him to do, my friends. He wasn't concerned about retirement. He wasn't concerned about his annuities. He wasn't concerned about the stock market, my friends, or properties that he had. He was concerned about faithfulness. He was concerned about bringing the gospel presentation to people that had never heard it before. And the Lord said, go into the city and you'll be told what to do. And they led him into the city. And Ananias prayed over him. And he received his sight. And the Lord took time with him. And the Lord taught him. And he spent some time with the other disciples. And they received him. And God gave him wisdom. Wisdom. To understand the Old Testament and write two-thirds of the New Testament, which we have today, my friends. But it's important for you to understand that even though Paul has written two-thirds of the New Testament, the Old Testament did not go away. So as we look at Romans 10, verses 15 through 21, here is the Apostle Paul sharing what was said in the Old Testament through Moses and Isaiah. So I am using prophetic verses from the Old Testament to help you to understand Paul's writing in Rome to the Romans in chapter 10. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. He is speaking about the Jewish people. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Somebody say amen. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I don't know how you live your life. That is between you and the Lord, my friends. If you want to bring me into it, you can. But I want you to know one thing. God has set you apart to preach the gospel. It doesn't matter if you're a lay person. It doesn't matter if you're an ordained minister. God has called you to preach the gospel. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And God has called each and every one of us to be ministers. Verse 18 says, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, they have heard. Their sound has gone out from the earth and their words to the end of the world. That means that the word is being proclaimed. 
People are listening. Jesus said, look up at the fields and see that the harvest is ripe, my friends. But the labors are few. But I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. Who is Moses referring to? These are God's elect, my friends. The chosen people of God are being told that they are not going to be the only ones of God. Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me, says the Lord. I was made manifest to those they did not ask for me, says the Lord. Oh, I like that. I like the fact that the Lord reminds me that he can be found when, when, when we seek him. That He reminds us, knock and the door shall be open for you. He says, they found me who did not seek me, and I was made manifest to those who did not even ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So we're going to start at verse 16, and it's not going to take very long to get through these verses, but there's a few things I think you need to understand. He says they have not all obeyed the gospel. Not all obey the gospel. There are wolves in sheep's clothing, my friend. Because it feels good to be a sheep. There are people who can blend in in any social situation, even church. If salvation is so simple, available to all who trust in the person and work of Jesus, then why does Israel seem to be cast off from God? Well, that was my question. Because many among them had not believed his report according to the scripture because they did not trust in his word through Isaiah and other messengers of the gospel. So therefore, they are not saved. Because it's too easy to be saved. You see, you surrender your heart for salvation. You do not work for salvation. And in verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Saving faith comes by hearing the word of God. Though Israel heard, they did not exercise saving faith, which makes them and us more responsible. It's that discernment, my friends. Dietrich Bonhoeffer refers to it as cheap grace. Cheap grace is the grace that we bestow on ourselves. It is not a gift of God. It's something that we think we deserve. We think we deserve, so we receive it. And in verse 18, the testimony of Psalm 19.4, but I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed they've heard. They've been hearing for 4,000 years. Their sound has gone out from the earth, but they have decided to hold this message and keep it for themselves, my friends. Oh, God help us if we take this message because God has commanded us to go into all the world and to preach the word of God. But if we want to keep it and protect it and make it personal, make it ours, my friends, Because we feel like the chosen few. God help us if we don't share what he has done in our life. They did not exercise saving faith in Christ, making them and us all the more responsible. But their sound has gone out from the earth. What would it have looked like if Jesus didn't go to the lost sheep of Israel? Now, if you're a Mormon today... You believe that Jesus evangelized America after the resurrection. There's nothing in Scripture that supports that. So I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I believe that Jesus realized that through 12, 24, 48, 72 people, hundreds 
And thousands of people who got saved would take this message through persecution and spread it all over the world. And when everybody has heard this message, he said, I will come back. And if I come back, I will take you to be with me that you may be where I am. So how much time do you think you have? How much time before Jesus comes back, my friends? I think he can come back any time. And I know he will come back. It's one of the seven tenets of the Christian faith in which I will lose blood over, my friends. Cheap grace. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of the church. We are fighting today for costly grace. Cheap grace means grace as a doctrine, a principle, or a system. It means forgiveness of sins proclaimed as a general truth that God taught the Christian conception of God. It's just this information to receive as if you're a college student listening to a lecture. Cheap grace. You see, there were t- sometimes when I was in Bible college at the Nazarene Bible College, there were times that my professors would speak into me and tears would well up in my eyes and I was receiving that. Sometimes there were far less meaningful things they would say and it was just informational stuff I had to write down so I could pass the test. Cheap grace means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. Cheap grace is because Jesus died on a cross. That is enough, my friends. But it isn't. It is justification of the sinner. If you don't think you're a sinner, maybe you believe in cheap grace. Grace alone does everything they say, and so everything can remain as it was before. All for sin cannot atone. Well then, let the Christian live like the rest of the world. Let him model himself on the world's standards. In every sphere of life, and not presumptuously aspire to live a different life under grace from his old life of sin. That was the heresy of the enthusiasts, the Anabaptists, and all of the rest, my friends cheap grace cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance baptism without church discipline communion without confession absolution without personal confession cheap grace is ultimately belief without obedience Hearing without doing. Intellectual assent without a life commitment. Cheap grace. It says you don't have to be concerned about purity. It says you don't have to be concerned about holiness and obedience because Jesus already did that. And so you don't have to, my friends. He did all that, empowered by the Holy Spirit so that his life could live again through us. God's grace has everything to do with our position in Him, our relationship with Him, through Him. Our salvation is in Him, through Him, and our standing is before Him. And our identity as new creations is in Him. It's not in anything else. But cheap grace operates not on those things, but in the deceitful workings of a person's behavior. Therefore, behavior modification is what's needed. Cheap grace can never accomplish what grace from God can do. Cheap grace can never accomplish what God's grace can do. Cheap grace allows you to justify your behavior. God's grace justifies your person. Cheap grace will center its focus and attention on the things of God, but not on God himself. Cheap grace focuses on the teachings of Jesus, but not the person of Jesus. 
It will focus on behavior instead of relationship. It concentrates on a lifestyle instead of life of obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. The grace we bestow on ourselves is ultimately self-centered, no matter how godly we may feel. So when someone says that grace is just a license to sin, that is correct. Because it means cheap grace. Cheap grace is grace that helps not require death. That is death to the flesh, and there is no dying out to self. Cheap grace. So it's important for the Apostle Paul to understand and help the Roman church to understand that yes, there's a place for the law and information, but there's a greater place for transformation. Information leads to transformation. And in verse 18, he says, to the ends of the world... And I like that, because that's where we are. Their voice has gone out to the ends of the earth. Their voices have gone out to the ends of the world, it says in verse 18. Do you believe that already? I do. And I believe when Jesus comes back, he's going to come back different than he did when he was here before. But then he goes on to say, I will provoke you to jealousy. Now, I remember the first time I read that God was a jealous God. You remember the first time you read that and you struggled with it a little bit? How can God be a jealous God? It's such a, a negative connotation. I don't think I like that. I mean, we all struggle with jealousy from time to time, but the Bible says, I am a jealous God. He's jealous over his people. He loves his people. He's protective over his people. God told Israel that he would bring others close to him and make them jealous. Yet Israel ignored this word also, making them more accountable. Do you struggle with jealousy? Because God does. Maybe you're in good hands. So I'm going to be a little transparent with you today and um, I have been a lot more lately transparent with you. I, I, I don't know why. I think I'm feeling more comfortable with you, and I hope that's okay because I'm not the pastor behind the curtain that's on a pedestal, and I don't want you to put me there. But I'm going to be real honest with you that when my first son was born in 2000, um, he had uh, just usual uh, milestones, and he hit all the markers, you know, he uh, I thought he was very clever, uh, doing well, progressing nicely. At two years old, he was diagnosed as having autism, uh, low-functioning autism. He would uh, not have good eye contact with me, and then I started recognizing my other son, who was now one, and realizing that he also had a form of autism, a disability, and I became very jealous. I became very jealous of other people who had healthy children, what we would call neurotypical children. Say, well, my children are healthy. They're going to live a long life, and I know that. And, and, and I want to preface this by saying they are happier than most of you. They don't have the stress that you do. A couple days ago, I picked up my son to take him out for lunch, and I heard the words that no father wants to hear. Barbecue? Say yes. <laughs> Don't want to hear that. Don't want to hear it. Salad bar? Chinese food? Thai food? I, 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 I can do Culver's? Barbecue? Say yes. I had the worst meal of my life. <laughs> and we went to... Sonny's. I know you like it, and that you're probably going to be there today, and you'll be laughing about this sermon when you're there. Boy, if Pastor John was here, he'd be miserable. He would be. The only thing good is a little piece of cornbread. 
with that cinnamon butter. <laughs> Do you guys know what I'm talking about? It's good, right? I struggle with jealousy. You see, I struggled with it for many years. Because I've seen people that have crack babies healthier than mine. That doesn't sound fair, does it? She wouldn't have chocolate when she was pregnant. That girl is a champion. So much so, I don't even think she can listen to this part of the message. She sat in the back. I don't know where she's at now. She may have taken him out. So I'm just being honest with you about my jealousy. Because I know I'm not alone, and I know you have struggled with jealousy too. But I'm going to go one step further. And this is going to surprise some of you, and it's probably going to maybe disappoint you a little bit. It was like it happened yesterday. Because I love my boys so much, and I feel a certain amount of protection over them. Though now they're starting to get a little more freedoms, but when they were younger, they didn't get hardly any. You see, I had to be with them all the time. I was very protective. I was very protective over them. I was very jealous of them. I wanted to make sure that I could care for them. But I remember this one particular time. I got home from a church where, you know, I worked, and we had a bad relationship with one of our neighbors, and I don't know why, but they had beautiful children, and they were really nice people at first, and for whatever reason, they didn't like our kids, and they would always complain. Our kids were getting into their stuff and making noises in the backyard, you know, these uncontrollable noises and ticks and things. And so I thought, you know, that's not really nice. You know, but I didn't really think that. I thought something else. That's, that's, that's the Christian version. That's not real, they're, they're not really being nice to me. But I got home this one day from work, and uh, this guy was about my age, maybe, and, uh, and, and, and so he had stopped waving at me, you know, because he, he got tired of, you know, having to complain about my kids all the time and me not being able to fix them, you know, because apparently that's what parents are supposed to do, like I'm going to beat it out of them, you know, spank them until the autism is gone, that's going to work, right? But I got home, and Dina said to me, I'll never forget it, she said, the neighbor came over because... Weston kept yelling and he wouldn't stop and he was in the backyard. And he said, you need to shut up that kid. But instead of saying that kid, he used an R word. If you don't know what the R word is, we don't say it in church. If you don't know what the R word is, you don't say it anywhere. And you never say it to me. And you never say it to Dina. So I became very angry. So I walked over to his house and I knocked on his door as hard as I could. I mean, I really knocked on his door. He came to the door and I grabbed his collar and I walked him over to my house and I said, you're going to apologize to my wife and then you're going to apologize to my son. And he did because I didn't give him a choice I didn't want to get arrested so I didn't put my hands on him but I had his collar and I wouldn't let him go and with tears in his eyes he apologized to my wife and then he apologized to my son and he still never waved at me again you see if I feel that way about my sons, how does God feel about you? I'm human. I'm sinful. I struggle. I have challenges. I realize there are limitations. And I realize I'm not the best parent. I haven't received any awards yet. I don't see any coming my way anytime soon. But if I feel that protective over my sons, who does not know what the R word even means, were not even affected by my neighbor. 
Who are you to think that God doesn't get jealous over you? That God isn't protective over you? Who are you to think that for a moment God is not aware of what you're going through? He's not aware of your cancer. He's not aware of your problems, your radiation. He's not aware of your finances. Who are you to think? He is your child, my friends. You are the daughter of the king. You're, you're the son of royalty, my friends. He knows everything about you. He will take your neighbor by the collar. He will bring them to your house, and he will make them apologize to you because he is a loving God. And that's how much he loves you. And he hasn't changed his mind about you. I know that I know that I know that that's how God feels for me. And I know that's how I feel for my son. And if you have children, you understand. It's the way it is. Shep was the newest member of our family. Shep was a sheepdog who openly displays his jealousy when I kiss my wife, says Matt. He doesn't snarl or bite, but in the language of barking, he seems to be saying, Hey, master, you belong to me. His jealousy gives me a good feeling. After all, we don't all like someone to care that much about us. But there's another kind of jealousy, a righteous jealousy at work in the life of every Christian. It's not the yearning of a subject for his master like that of the sheepdog, but of the master for his subjects, his children. Someone has rephrased James 4, 5, and 6 to read, Do you think that Scripture says without reason that the Holy Spirit, whom God cause to live in you jealously wants us exclusively to himself in order to pour out his grace on you generously. God doesn't want to share you with the world. God doesn't want to share you with sin. God doesn't want to share you with anyone, my friends. The sheepdog can be insecure God is not insecure. He wants you, and he wants all of you. And finally, it says they are a disobedient, they are a contrary people, according to the New King James Version. This tells God's assessment of disobedience. They are the Messiah rejecting Israel. They are a disobedient and contrary people, and all the more so because of their great responsibility before God. My friends, you have a responsibility before God. Isaiah 49, 6 says, You know they were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles, but they wanted to keep that light for themselves. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. And that's it. So what do we do with this? Because at this point, now you need to make a decision whether you're going to keep it for yourself and let God be jealous. Because if we do, we're no different than they were. And God is speaking to us this morning. Matt, Mike, Jan, Lori, John, what I did for you was a light for others. Who are you to keep this for yourself when there are lost and hurting, dying people going to hell every day? Who are we to keep this beauty, this grace, not cheap grace, 
sustainable grace for just us. My friends, maybe you have lived a little bit selfish. You're a little bit like the end of, of, of Romans chapter 10. You, 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 you got Jesus... You've received Jesus, and you're just kind of holding him for yourself. But today, you want to say, you know, Lord, I have Jesus, and I have everything I need, but I serve a jealous God. And even though he is protective over me, he died for all mankind. And I will not keep this to myself. I will not be silent. And I am here to tell you, my friends, that this is a place of prayer. Maybe the Lord is speaking to you this morning and he is saying, get up out of your seat, get on your knees or stand before one of these prayer partners and say, I just need prayer because I am not a light like God wants me to be. I am not the light that God called me to be. I am not the son that I used to be. I am not the daughter that I could be. Would you stand with me? Let's uh, close our eyes and bow our heads. I want uh, everyone just to kind of search their hearts this morning. We've had a wonderful time of prayer and worship. A very simple message. Only six verses, but... Please don't forget how much God loves you. Don't forget what he's done for you. And you're not supposed to keep it to yourself. Maybe you need to come forward and say, you know what? I need to be an evangelist. My neighbor needs me. My sister needs to hear my message. I have bottled it up for too long and I need to to open up that bottle and let it out because it wasn't mine to keep. What God did in me was mine to share. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these that are standing before you in your congregation today, dear Lord. Father, we thank you for Romans 10 that reminds us of Isaiah and what Moses said, Lord. That you will accept a people that are not your people. We didn't look for you. We didn't ask for you, Jesus. But you shown yourself to us. And for that, we are so grateful, Lord. Father, I know every one of us carries a light within our heart. Does it reach our mouths? Does it reach our minds? Does it reach our hands? In such a way, Lord, that we can model Jesus. That we can tell others what God has done for us. I know there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And this is not a guilt-ridden message, Lord. It's a reminder that we don't want to be like them in Israel 2,000 years ago. Help us, Lord, to get our friends ready because you're coming back again soon. And when you come back, Lord, in all your glory, we want everyone to go with us. We want to receive everything you have for us. We want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter now into my kingdom and take our seats at the great feast. Life is short, Lord. Don't let us live with this message bottled up any longer. Let us love others into the kingdom. Let us lead them into the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said... Amen. You are dismissed, my friends. Have a wonderful day.